Taiwan, a country I'm proud to say I'm from. In my career as a media entrepreneur, I've spoken to movers and shakers here who make global headlines. But what I'm most excited about are the up and coming forces of my generation. They're young, they're creative, they dare to defy the status quo. Follow me as I meet emerging leaders of Taiwan who lift us, who inspire us, who are changing the world, starting in Taiwan. This is Game Changers with Emily Waiwu. Today, we speak to an artist. In the US, less than 20,000 students graduate from the master's program of fine arts each year. And at the undergraduate level for college, for art colleges, only 10% do make their living as working artists. While our game changer today, he's making it work in the US and in Taiwan. Ni Hao is an up and coming artist from Taiwan, an emerging artist in the global contemporary art scenes. He combines videos, sculptures, and sound work into his installations. He's had solo exhibitions in Rome, in Basel, Shanghai, Taipei, Puerto Rico. He's had group exhibitions in many more places of the world too. And recently, he was just at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, where he got to hang out and spend some time with scientists. We'll ask him about that. So let's meet our game changer today, Ni Hao, a Taiwanese emerging artist in the global contemporary art scene. Hey, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Hey, thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me. For artists, you get to do something called the residency programs. Uh -huh. It's where you spend some time at a usually a really cool location. Yeah. And all you need to do is produce art. Yeah. So with residency programs, you've been in Singapore, uh, you've been in California, in New York, uh, in Colombia. And recently, you were a guest artist at CERN, the Scientific Research Center, yeah. where the God's particle was discovered in 20, 2012. Mm -hmm. What did you do there? You know, I was, I was actually accompanying a uh, Chinese science fiction writer. Uh -huh. uh, so he was actually uh, writing a book. I think the story starts, you know, from CERN. So he, he had to do, go there to do research trip. So I, I just kind of tagged along, to be honest. Uh, and then, uh, but it was, it was such an amazing experience because we're both uh, residents uh, from the Provitia program. Which is a program with the Switzerland government. It's, it's, you know, they do like residency programs. And so I was like lucky enough to, to be there. You know, I was doing a residency at La Bec, you know, which is near Lausanne. We, we kind of just emailed them and we was like, hey, you know, we, we want to come over. Can we do a, you know, do a trip together? They said yes. And so we went and then, uh, and that was just a crazy experience, really. You know? yeah, yeah, you saw something <laughs> called, it was the, the anti-matter factory. What's, what's that? So what, what they're known for is, uh, you know, particle accelerator, anti-matter factory. Um, is is the uh, decelerator actually? So they capture what's called the entire matter. But you know what? I, I don't know the, that much about the science. I just yeah. see like bunch of like crazy machines. If you imagine like a crazy scientist laboratory, everything was like ugly. You know, like just saran wrapped, everything shiny, all these like machines. So what you do, um, you work with yeah. very very physical objects. Yeah. Um, unlike the entire matter factory, yeah. IKEA machines dehumidifiers, um, there are wall-sized installations, or oftentimes uh, for the viewer, we have to be inside the room to yeah. really experience that art. Um, there are life sides, um, really hard materials. I'm trained as a sculptor, uh, so I work with a, a lot of like objects and materials. Yeah. All day I think about, you know, the, our relationship to, to these, you know, what's in front of us. You know, everyday objects, because we're, we're made out of um, what's around us, right? You know, materially, from everything we wear, everything we eat, the kind of things we interact with yeah. every day. It, it's very much object-based. This is kind of like where I think a lot about the work and the, trying to find possibilities within this kind of relationship, right? You know, and then... So maybe talk to us about a couple of pieces that, um, recently that you're really proud of that... One of them is a work called Ambush. It's two um, ATM machine, fake ATM machine, with angle grinder inside of it. So the audience could, in the same way how they use uh, ATM machines. So, so basically, you get these like plastic cards, and if you insert it into the machine, uh, and uh, it starts to, it, it shoots out, the, you know, the angle grinder would like squeeze the cards and shoot them out like darts. Uh -huh. so, so basically transforming this like um, ATM experience into like a dangerous uh, uh, gun, you know, a machine gun, basically. In front of the machines are uh, this pretty elaborate uh, installation uh, inside this uh, glass conference room. 
but I made a, a lot of like, um, you know, targets for, for these machines actually. So, so they're kind of inspired by real shooting ranges. So the audience are encouraged to use these cards and, you know, to, to break everything that's inside of it. Yeah. 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 So there's like become, become this like really chaotic, crazy, Where? destructive scene. Where was it exhibited? 2019, you know, I showed it at the TFAM, Taipei Fine Art Museum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's for a solo show. It was like the biggest uh, solo show I've ever done, you know, in my life. And then it, that was only one work, it was, but it was a centerpiece. Yeah. yeah. So like, it was, yeah, yeah, it was pretty crazy. The other work, it's, uh, it's called uh, Structures Study One. I had these two recorder flutes, plastic recorder flute. So, you know. Which is very popular with right. uh, school children in Taiwan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, so that, that's definitely the starting point. Um, yeah, so, so I started just playing with them, you know, just uh, without any kind of plan or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just heated them up, you know. Heating uh, them up. Yeah, heating, oh. heat them up, up with like fire and, and oh. heat guns and stuff like that. And then uh, I started like melting them together to, to try to make like new structure out of it. And then uh, and then very soon I realized, like, yeah, yeah, you know, you, I can actually uh, build this whole, you know, this organic kind of uh, uh, rhizomatic structure out of it. And then uh, by the same time, this is still a playable instrument. So, so I started like building this bigger and bigger. But what's interesting is this, I very casually just Googled like the history of recorded flute. Mm -hmm. And I realized um, there was this whole history of how the recorded flute, you know, was revived in the 1920s in Germany and how it traveled all the way to Taiwan and Asia and throughout mm -hmm. the world, really. Mm -hmm. And then this whole history, which has everything to do with modernism, fascism and groundbreaking musical education. Yeah. So in the end, I was really like thinking about so, whoa, okay, so now I can make these structures by hand, which looks pretty crazy. And but how do I make meaning? You know, how do I um, tell a story from this? So yeah, in the end, I hired like performers to, to create this like uh, elaborate um, dance and um, this performance and like, uh, and they're dressed as uh, students actually. So they're is talking, is bring back this, um, this work into this like, um, school setting, right? Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, I really do want to. It, it, that, that was a question that I was trying mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. answer for myself, really, mm -hmm. just like why children all around the world, mm -hmm. why did they, you know, uh, play recorded flutes in the first place? Why, why was it mandatory, you know? And then, um, and what? I just find that very interesting. And that piece was shown uh, just last year, you know, and then uh, again at Taipei Fire Museum. One of your pieces that I had seen at a group exhibition, also in Taipei, at the Museum of Contemporary Arts, you walk into a room and uh, you had six video panels yeah. up on the wall. Yeah. Um, there's drumming, there's a construction, there's an earthquake, there's traffic. Yeah. It's really loud. Um, but somehow there is a sense of order that you created, that you curated and created yeah. out of this. What questions are you trying to answer with your work? Yeah, uh, so, so that piece in particular, it was kind of like, um, a uh, piece where I collected um, many YouTube videos of just like everyday things happening. Birds flying, whatever, you know, like earthquake, horse running, and then they make these sounds. Yeah. And by vibration, that that's kind of sound like drumming. And then I give all these videos to three drummers. And then uh, so they're supposed to mimic the sound and translate it into drumming again, you know? So when I play them all together, they be it becomes like a orchestra. Just drums and beats and, you know, and then uh, in an attempt to, I guess, translate the world, you know, mm -hmm. back into sort of this like a, this is like a very primitive way of like thinking about their fundamental, uh, a very fundamental way of how, how the world works, you know, just through vibration and beats and, you know, rhythm. And then uh, everyday life, um, different pieces. Well, you know, like, yeah, a lot of what I do, I think it's, um, I think it's really about like how, how to look at the world through, throughout all these years of training and whatever, mm -hmm. thinking about art, doing art. I have a pretty good sense in, in capturing those moments and then recognizing the poetic, you know, moments within, yeah, you know, in, in our, just, it's just 
life, you know, yeah, and then yeah, and then just bring yeah. them forward. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then showing showing the audience, you know, just presenting them in the way that makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think with contemporary art, it takes a little bit to understand because you need to read the artist statement to understand what it is that you're trying to discover. Because contemporary art, it's evolving as the society changes. It may be a bit foreign and not as easily understandable. Um, how do you explain your art to people that say who are perhaps more familiar with paintings um, or like a sculpture, uh, a traditional a classic sculpture? Because, because, because it doesn't it look like the art that yeah. they studied uh, growing up. We're, we're familiar with the classics, but I think what contemporary yeah. art does, which is really well, interesting, is yeah. the translation of the yeah. world as it is today, right? Your work. Yeah, yeah. Um, on you know on construction on modernity on consumerism you have a work yeah, about yeah. tinder yeah. right like how do you explain contemporary art to people well you know it's it's like um i think right now it's like anything goes you have absolute freedom you know because for the past like a couple hundred years they already done everything uh yeah that you can literally use anything um to to make it art really you can talk about anything use whatever materials but if you really think about it we also didn't come that far you know everything is still sculpture Everything is sculptural, everything is aesthetically driven, especially now, mm -hmm. you know, we live in this day, today, people exciticize themselves, you know, and actually is a requirement, you know, if you think about social media, you know, like stuff like that. To me, I don't think a lot has changed, but today, sure, we do have um, uh, more mediums mm -hmm. to play with, you know, and especially like in the tech sectors and stuff like that. It's not so, I mean, I think it's, it's not like hard to understand, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like looking at art, it's just kind of like listening to, to, to a song. Mm -hmm. If you like it, you like it, you know, you don't, you don't, you know, like, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. if you understand it, yeah. the history or the background or whatever of that particular song, you can go more in depth, right? Yeah. Like, I think the immediate, uh, your reaction is like, okay, you, you, you look at this thing, you know, um, yeah. How did how did it make you feel? How does it make you feel? You know, like uh, you know, you can you can go with your memories. You know, just like it's, it's just yeah, it's just yeah. how you perceive it. You know, like the first set. I mean, a lot of art right now they do you know conceptual art or stuff like that. They mm -hmm. do require elaborate statements. You know, but regular usually I think you know uh, visual art is very uh, pretty straightforward. You know, yeah. I mean, like it's it's you're about about your personal. Memory, you know, and mm -hmm. posture about your, your your personal experience. You know, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. come into the space, uh, and then you're engaging with these things. You know, from your your own point of view. You yeah, know, really. yeah. I guess for for um, even yeah. the classic art during yeah. their time, much of that classic art was deemed too weird, too bizarre, too new. Right. I guess that's what contemporary art does, which is pushing our boundary, pushing our mm -hmm. imagination yeah. of what is possible or how do we translate the world. Yeah. Well, I want to take a break, sure. and um, when we come back, yeah. I want to ask you about how you yeah. became an artist. Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. Yeah. Let's take a break. Hey, welcome back to Game Changers with Emily Wai Wu. This is where I talk to emerging leaders in their industries who are making a difference in the world. Today, we've been talking to Ni Hao, an emerging artist, multimedia artist, a sculptor uh, who has done residencies and solo exhibitions and group exhibitions across America, Asia, South America, and Europe. So you're from Taiwan. Yeah. You went to art school first in Chicago and then yeah. in Rhode Island School of Design. Yeah. As a boy, what art did you do? What did you draw? Uh, you know, uh, animals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know, things uh -huh. like a this character. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, I didn't win any award. I was never that good, good enough or, mm -hmm. you know, a drawing or anything like that. Uh, it wasn't until like, high school where I like actually started doing a lot of art. You know, we had a pretty good art program. Now I'm kind of glad I, I don't really, you know, have any like awards, you know, because uh, because I, I just think that they, they put you in a box, right? You know, like, you know, I, I want to be the, the kind of person who the kind of artists that uh, make weird things, you know. Who do you make art for now? Is there, who is your intended audience? It's hard to say. I think, um, uh, you know, I, I make art for everybody. And, mm -hmm. and, but at the same time, nobody, you know, I, I make art for, for myself, you know, uh, really. You know, a lot of times I think it's, it's just, uh, it has to start from, from myself. And then, uh, but it really depends, you know, it really depends on the shows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, like because every different place you show, they have different kind of audience, and then of course that come into con consideration when I make art. But but really the foundation, the 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 very basic uh, 
point of this is um, that you know I I make art for myself really you know I'm following a path that's that's been a long time in the making mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm just going towards that it falls into place like that too like I don't have to like you either like it or don't you know what I mean like you either get it or you don't I mean like like once people know what you're doing yeah they're gonna put you in the right place you yeah. know and then uh, I think so I don't I don't ever have to I think deal with people who are not my audience or something like that? It's well, a really hard question, actually, yeah. For everybody yeah. who went to art school in the US, the yeah. statistics are that if you study art on, as an undergrad, only 10% do make it as a living as living an artist. artist. And if you do advance on into for a master's, um, mm -hmm. only about 20,000 graduates each yeah. year. Yeah. Um, and I think when it comes to art, there is a lot of stereotypes, for example, the starving artist or the, how much do you have to hustle? What percentage is you know you disappearing into the studio and just there hours and hours and yeah. nights after nights and how much was it right. kind of walking around getting inspirations and talking to people? Yeah, well, ideally haven't have, but you know I think yeah it's a it's a pretty uh, lonely uh, profession for me at least. You know I, I spend a lot of time in the studio, um, just a lot of time just by myself. I don't see anybody, um, and then. Um, yeah, and you know, sometimes I work with people, but every exhibition takes like a really long time uh, mm -hmm. to put together, um, to organize, to plan. Uh, you do get used to it, though, you know. And then, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm pretty good at spending, you know, time with myself. Um, but going out and meeting people is very important too. You know, yeah. uh, you you do uh, want to have a community. Like usually, we do have to go to openings. So you've been in group exhibitions at the Taipei Fine Arts Museum, at yeah. the uh, Museum of uh, Contemporary Arts in Taipei, or yeah. at the UCCA in Beijing, yeah. or the Contemporary Art Museum in Korea, and, and many others. Yeah. Um, give us a sense of what is the scene in the contemporary art scene? What's the trend now? The art world is really large, and then, uh, there's so many different kinds of art world too. Yeah. You know, and then, uh, and a different, you know, different region, they do like contemporary art differently too. They have different kinds of market or audience, different kinds of history they're dealing with, you know, and then, uh, it's, it's still like a Western, very Western centric field. This is contemporary art just is, is still Western art. Yeah, the main markets are in Europe, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. United States, Asia, there, there are talks now mm -hmm. that they're saying like Asia is emerging. So what are the museums looking for from Asian artists? Uh, you know, I think it really depends on what their, you know, what, what their program is. I mean, this is this is a complicated issue because uh, why does a city need museum, you know? What does it do, you know, right. why should government put money in this? Uh, I mean, I can say a lot about this, but you know, it's a, it's a quite complicated issue. I mean, what, what does art do for the society at large? And does, does the government it? understand it? Or, you know, what do artists want to say? What's more urgent for for some people, or yeah. probably not for the others. Well, what's your answer to that? To why museums need to exist? I think uh, we do need. Uh, why we need art is because it's a constant reflection of you know what what it means to be humans. Why there's so many songs about love, right? You know because it's the kind of thing that you can't really. It's human it's experience. Not, it's, yeah, yeah. It's just human experience that's ephemeral. You know, it's can, it's out there. We need this constant, you know, ritualistic uh, uh, performance yeah. to yeah. to conjure it, right? To to summon it, you know, for a moment, so, that, so we can like all appreciate it, you know, to to feel it. And then uh, I think I think art it's it's the ultimate freedom, you know. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's like I can literally do anything mm -hmm. that I want, but this anything isn't isn't just whatever. I mm -hmm. think and research carefully. Mm -hmm. On, on whatever I'm trying to work with, and then yeah. uh, in which field I'm gonna dive in. So I have a rule for myself. Basically, it's like um, whatever project I want to do, uh, I do want to learn a new skill. You know, mm. so like you know, this allows me to to grow with my art. You know, and then yeah. as as a person, yeah. and then uh, and then and what, I think that one of the most important thing for art is you know they're they're literally like the ghosts that can go through walls, you know, like in different field, different, you know, discipline. And then we're allowed to combine things together. Yeah, it's an exploration of um, this yeah. world, right? Of the emotions, yeah. our human experiences, right? That and then, or, or you know, storytelling, narrative, like what, what are the, some hidden stories in, in our lives 
that that should be told, you know, specific group of people or you know culture. Right. But also, it creates something new, right? You know, like a new perspective, new perspectives mm -hmm. in uh, in looking at the everyday life. I think it's needed for us to think about things, think about our own lives in a different way, and and I think this is kind of eventually what contemporary art does is challenging the way we perceive the world. So, what are you working on next? I'm trying to organize a. Uh, um, a, a sort of like a music performance that's sort of like a remake of a uh, 90, 1920s uh, Russian avant-garde uh, musical piece. But also there's another work um, uh, uh, that I'm doing, uh, which is like kinetic sculptures. Okay. Uh, kinetic sculptures. Kinetic sculptures, uh, that's pretty large scales. Uh, including, you know, and those are uh, based off of uh, scooters. So okay. yeah, I'm we, just will, to, uh, yeah. we will, we uh, will keep following your work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, yeah. one final thing before we let you go yeah. uh, to go back to your studio is uh, the question we ask everybody here: yeah. Yeah. is out of your accomplishments so far, how much was given to you versus how much did you have to fight for? I work pretty hard. I have a lot of ideas, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like a restless artist. You know, I'm, I'm lucky. You know, I'm pretty actually very lucky. You know, I kind of just do my own things with what's available. I think, you know, once you have a vision and people see it, see what you're doing, and they just, they're interested, you know, and then they just kind of, they want to collaborate with you and stuff like that. So I think uh, you just have to stick with what you're doing. But how much of it is fighting? I don't know. I, I don't think it's a traditional sense of like, bang on the table, be like, hey, I'm, I'm really good. Like, it doesn't work this way here. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is like, you know, we're talking about like long periods of time, right? You know, mm -hmm. like, after spending so many months and I create this work, yeah. and then you show it, and then the shows are usually like a month, you know? And then you don't really see people who go there. You mean, you're not gonna be there all the time. So it's those people responding to my art directly. They maybe they like it and stuff like that. And then, and then they, they, they'll contact me months later to give me opportunities. Well, so thank can... you for giving us a glimpse um, of what it's like to be an artist today in the contemporary art scene. Oh. Um, just from the number of times your names have popped up around the world. Um, it's really quite cool. And I am so glad that I, I got to see some of that work in the past several years that you've been back wow. in Taiwan. Um, yeah. I look forward to more and best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me over. Thank yeah, you. Really, yeah. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Ni Hao, multimedia artist, sculptor, emerging artist in the contemporary art world scene. Um, now, if you're also a sculptor, if you've been to Ni Hao's show, do reach out to him. And for me, Emily Wai Wu, you can find me on my socials. Thank you for watching. This is Taiwan Plus. Follow and subscribe on all social media channels. We'll see you next time.